One of the things I love about Furness Abbey is its rich red sandstone. It is growing old very gracefully. Weathered by centuries of wind, frost, rain and sun, it is crumbly and sandy to the touch. In his prelude, William Wordsworth calls Furness Abbey a mouldering pile, suggesting a slow decay caused by neglect. In another poem of 1845, he writes again of nature reclaiming this abandoned place, of ivy reclaiming the walls, and, on the mouldered walls, how bright, how gay, the flowers in pearly dews their bloom renewing. Oh yes, and the birds. Wordsworth writes of the joyful cawing of birds at sunrise from the top of the tower. Yes, I should mention the birds, another of the things I love about Furness Abbey. Birds and red sandstone. So one day in May, when I saw the abbey glowing beautifully red in the early evening sun, I had to stop. The footpath into Abbot's Wood gave a different perspective to look at the reds and greens in sun and shadow. As I stood and stared, I imagined the monk's life. Routine, ritual, hard work, broken sleep. But then, something I've never seen from here before, cattle. Yes, of course the monks were farmers and kept granges and cattle and sheep. That was one of the reasons they came here. But I'm not usually reminded of this so close to the Abbey precinct. Now, I've seen cattle before upstream by the Mill Beck, but never quite like this, up on a hill above the Abbey, overlooking the ruins, these sandstone walls, hundreds of years old. But of course, these cattle are in one of the abbey quarries, a quarry now so well hidden by trees that we forget it's still there, a quarry which produced the very same warm red sunbathed sandstone I had stopped here today to admire. Thank you, cattle, for this reminder. A few days later, I went back for a closer look. In 1124, Stephen, grandson of William the Conqueror and later King of England, invited 12 Savignac monks to set up a house at Tulketh in Preston. It occupied a site here on the river cliff overlooking the River Ribble. The site of the monastery soon after became the site of Tulketh Hall and so stayed on local maps well into the 20th century. This was a river crossing frontier land in the 12th century, and so, in 1127, the monks moved to the Vale of Beaconsgill, or the Vale of Nightshade, on the Furness Peninsula. Why did they choose this particular place? Of course they were looking for seclusion and peace. This valley was sheltered with a good water supply. 
Lower Furness was rich in iron ore and good farmland for sheep, cattle and crops. The deep water harbour at Peel would give control of trade between the Abbey and the Isle of Man and Ireland, and also allow daughter houses to be set up. There was salt production, peat workings, fisheries and oyster beds. So there may well have been several sites in Lower Furness which would have suited, but I suspect that they came here to the Vale of Nightshade above all for one reason only. Ready access to timber and stone. Red sandstone. This red sandstone in these quarries. There are several quarries hidden here still in the Vale of Nightshade. The building stone could not have been closer. This quarry at Furness is an outcrop of one layer of the Triassic Sherwood sandstone group, also known locally as St Bees sandstone, named after its most prominent outcrop at St Bees Head. The word Triassic means that it is more than 200 million years old. From St Bees, the sandstone layers run down the Cumbrian coast to Barron Furness and then on into Lancashire and Cheshire. They may well also be the layers that hold the gas in the Morecambe Bay gas field. Sherwood sandstone is a sedimentary rock, a reddish stone created by waterborne sand with a very small grain size, making the rock very workable for building and carving. And so, in 1127, the monks of Savigny arrived in the Vale of Nightshade, a steep-sided, sheltered valley fed by the Mill Beck, which had cut deep into the Sherwood sandstone geology. Perfect. Barrow people have visited the natural amphitheatre at Furness Abbey for generations, to roll eggs at Easter, to sledge in winter, to attend occasional concerts and events. There used to be a football pitch here too. But in the trees at the foot of the hill, there lie hidden the remains of another quarry. Old tracks lead out from this quarry, from its side, a curving one around the hill which finally reaches ground level by the abbey. And from above the quarry, a track that goes across the top of the amphitheatre just below the precinct wall. Perhaps this pathway links to my cattle quarry. And that ditch which runs down from the top path to the lower one. Maybe all these tracks are leftovers from dragging newly quarried stone down to the abbey. And the Abbey Precinct wall up on high is of course built from this sandstone too. There are more quarry faces hidden alongside the mill beck in the trees of Abbot's Wood, and some of these are inside the church site itself. Having all these quarries producing good quality stone within, forgive me, a stone throw of your chosen building site is no accident. I believe this is why Furness Abbey is where it is today. The original buildings of 1127 are likely to have been temporary ones of wood whilst the monastery was built. The earliest building work was probably in the presbytery and the transepts. Looking from the cemetery today into the south transept chapels, there is a band of decorative mouldings which were salvaged from the original Savignac church and reused as facing stones. Furness Abbey became Cistercian in 1147 and building continued throughout most of the life of the abbey. Back in our cattle quarry there are some interesting features. Stone was carefully chosen to be cut from the quarry face before being dragged down this trackway to the abbey where masons would work and shape the stone ready for building, also leaving their marks to ensure payment. 
there are medieval chisel marks in the quarry as fresh as if they were made yesterday. And there are two faces carved into the stone, possibly also from medieval times. A reminder that real people with a sense of humour worked here. When you visit Peel Island, it's probably stone from these quarries at Furness which finishes and decorates the arches, doorways and windows of this rough built castle. Also the same stone that built Bow Bridge. And also the same stone that was used to build James Ramsden's house at Abbot's Wood, now sadly long demolished. The medieval abbey ruins at Barrow in Furness are probably the best example of large-scale use of Sherwood sandstone in Cumbria. They became popular in the 18th and 19th centuries with writers and painters. But Sherwood sandstone was used again much later in the building boom of Victorian Barrow, the town hall. The docks. Devonshire buildings and many more places. But then the supplying quarries were those at nearby Hawcourt, still an impressive sight and a pleasant walk today. So these furnace quarries are outcrops of something called early Triassic Sherwood sandstone, locally called St Bees sandstone. The internet tells me that Triassic is a period of time lasting 50 million years, between 250 and 200 million years ago. So the sandstone of Barrow buildings was made more than 200 million years ago. The internet also tells me that this Triassic period was when the dinosaurs started to evolve. The next period after Triassic was called the Jurassic, so that's quite a big clue then. And dinosaurs only eventually became extinct 65 million years ago. So the sandstone of Furness Abbey in Barrow is older than dinosaurs. So if you see an old dinosaur wandering around Furness Abbey looking at walls and stones, it'll probably be me. I've been doing it for years, well, well not millions, but long enough. Yes. I'm appreciating the colours, patterns, the feel and the texture of the stone, but at the same time I'm remembering the human beings who quarried it, who built with it, and the community that lived here alongside and within it for over 400 years. But even more crazy is that I'm able to touch something, just for a moment, which takes me back over 200 million years in Earth history. Now I might seem a bit daft and be the only person ever in the world to think like this, but I do hope not. Please find some time to come and visit Furness Abbey, for it is indeed a very special place. <laughs>